Welcome to the Surgical Edge podcast for surgical insights, reviews, discussions, and to stay updated. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're looking at a procedure that uh, really sits at the crossroads of surgical history and modern oncology. We're talking about abdominal perineal resection, or APR. Right. And while the name goes way back to Sir William Ernest Miles in 1908, what we do today is it's a completely different world. Absolutely. The techniques, the reasons we do it, and especially the outcomes have been totally transformed. And that's our mission for you in this deep dive. Yeah. We want to distill the really critical data to cut through the noise and just focus on the anatomical principles, the technical details that matter, and you know the real world outcome data that should be guiding your decisions for these low rectal and anal cancers. Right. This is the shortcut to being comprehensively well-informed on APR today. And of course, before we go any further, just a mandatory note on this. This content is for reference only and is intended to summarize existing literature. Always follow local guidelines and institutional protocols and clinical practice. Okay, so let's set the stage. Because despite all the advances in things like neoadjuvant therapy and this big push for sphincter-sparing surgery, APR is still needed for roughly 40% of patients with rectal cancer. It's not a footnote in a history book. Not at all. It's a current reality, which makes this deep dive, I think, essential. Hmm. Okay, so let's unpack that shift. When we talk about moving APR from you know the historical era into the modern one, it really all comes down to one core principle, right? One non-negotiable principle. Total mesorectal excision. TME. TME. Yeah. Historically, you had these blunt dissection techniques. It was messy. You'd get irregular tissue planes, tumor violations. And high recurrence rates, I assume. Exactly. TME standardized the whole thing. It demands sharp dissection right within the mesorectal fascia. You're not just taking the tumor. You're excising the entire three-dimensional mesorectal envelope. All the fat, the lymphatics, the blood vessels, completely and on block. It's all about finding and staying in that clean, avascular plane. Mm -hmm. So what's the clinical payoff for being that meticulous? Mm. Oh, the payoff is staggering. I mean, it completely revolutionized outcomes, local recurrence rates, which, like you said, were historically anywhere from, say, 14 to 45 percent. Wow. They now consistently sit between 4 and 7 percent. Just from that one technical principle. When TME principles are strictly applied, yes, that's the difference between failure and cure for so many people. So speaking of that sharp dissection... Our sources point to a really critical moment in the abdominal phase. It's about the vascular ligation. How do we get that oncological clearance, but also, you know, protect function? Mm. Where do we ligate the superior rectal artery? The consensus is very strong on this now. You want to suture ligate the superior rectal artery at its origin, so distal to the left colic artery. And why is that specific point so important? Well, the thinking there, it's about much more than just blood flow. When you ligate it right at its origin, you minimize the risk of damaging the sympathetic plexus. Those nerve fibers descend right near the proximal vessels. If you go too high, too proximal with your ligation, you risk splaying those nerves. And that sets the patient up for? For major post-operative sexual and urinary dysfunction. So <laughs> that early, precise vascular control is really your first move to prevent nerve injury later on. And that brings us to, you know, who are we actually doing this for today? Neoadjuvant chemoradiation has been a game changer. It's downstaged so many tumors and really narrowed the field for APR. So we have to be really clear about the indications. What are the absolutes? The situations where APR is basically non-negotiable to get a clear margin. Okay, so first is ultra-low rectal adenocarcinoma. We're talking tumors within four to six centimeters of the anal verge. If getting a clear margin means you have to sacrifice so much sphincter that function is impossible, APR is the right call. Makes sense. What else? Second, any tumor that shows direct invasion into the internal or external sphincter complex itself. And third, any demonstrated invasion of the levator any muscles, especially when it extends to or beyond the piborealis sling. Okay, and that last one requires that bigger perineal dissection we're going to talk about. There you are. But, and this is where it gets really interesting, it's not just about rectal cancer. There's this other group a really challenging population. Patients who need salvage APR for anal squamous cell carcinoma. Yes. These are the patients where the initial chemoradiation, the Negra protocol, didn't work. And their risk profile is totally different. It's significantly higher, yes. The sources are pretty sobering on this. For this group, major perineal wound complication rates are anywhere from a distressing 47% up to 80%. 80 80 that's huge. It is. It's substantially higher than for primary rectal cancer because you're operating in a field that is just 
heavily irradiated and scarred. The tissue has no memory of how to heal. Are those rates just inherent to the biology? <laughs> or can high volume centers, you know, do something to mitigate that? It seems to be mostly inherent to the tissue biology. The best way to mitigate it, and we'll get to this, isn't necessarily a better way to stitch it up. It's proactively bringing in new healthy tissue with flaps. You have to assume the field is already compromised. Which leads us right into preoperative planning. What are the absolute must-do steps before a patient even gets to the OR? It always starts with imaging. A dedicated rectal MRI using the cancer staging protocol is essential. That's your roadmap. It tells you about sphincter involvement, levator involvement. It defines the whole approach. It defines the approach. Then, of course, the multidisciplinary discussion to make sure the neoadjuvant therapy was right, the timing is right. But the one thing that often gets overlooked, and it's so critical, is preoperative stoma marking. By an interostomal therapist. By an experienced one, yes. The studies are clear. Proper marking significantly reduces post-operative stoma complications. It makes a huge difference for the patient's quality of life right out of the gate. Okay, so planning's done, patient's on the table. Let's talk about the surgery itself. You mentioned the risks in the abdominal phase. Not so much bleeding, but this invisible damage. Damage to the autonomic nervous system. Correct. As you're sweeping the posterior parietal fascia off the mesorectum, that's where the nerves are most vulnerable. If we trace them, the superior hypogastric plexus is up high, right in front of the aortic bifurcation. From there, you have the paired hypogastric nerves, which run down along the anterolateral pelvic sidewall. And that's the sympathetic input. Where does the parasympathetic part join in? That comes from the nervi aeruginosus, the pelvic splanchnic nerves from S2 to S4. They join the hypogastric nerves out laterally, often right near the lateral ligaments and the middle rectal pedicle. That area is the danger zone. Right, where you're dividing those lateral attachments. Exactly. If your dissection plane strays just a little too far laterally, you basically shear those nerves right off the fascia. And the functional deficits that result are, they're substantial. They are. The data confirms it. We're talking sexual dysfunction in 40 to 60% of patients. That includes things like erectile dysfunction, retrograde ejaculation. In men, yes. And vaginal dryness, dyspareunia in women. And urinary dysfunction is just as common, 30 to 60% of patients. It can be anything from temporary retention to, you know, chronic failure of the detrusor muscle. These numbers are just too high to be acceptable. Are we getting any better at knowing, you know, intraoperatively if we've saved the nerves? We are, thankfully. The data is very clear. We need to move beyond just looking. Visual assessment isn't enough then. Not even close. Visually, you're only about 46% sensitive in predicting postoperative function. But if you use intraoperative nerve stimulation with a probe to test for a response, that sensitivity for predicting urinary function jumps to 82%. Wow. So if you want a functional prognosis, you need a functional test. You need a functional assessment tool. It's that simple. All right. Let's shift gears to the perineal phase, actually removing the specimen. First decision is positioning. And the literature seems to have a clear winner for safety. Prone jackknife positioning is uh, definitely superior to the traditional lithotomy for this part of the operation. Why is that? It just gives you dramatically better access and visualization, especially mm -hmm. that anterior dissection plane, which in men can be really obscured by the prostate. The key stat here is that it reduces the rate of intraoperative tumor perforation. It drops from an unacceptable 20% down to about 6%. And preventing perforation is everything for oncologic safety. It's paramount. So let's talk about the techniques down there. We have the older way and then the more modern approaches. Right. So the standard older method is an extra sphincteric APR. The dissection is, like the name says, outside the external sphincter. Then there's intersphincteric APR, which is a modification where you spare the external sphincter. It's really only for very select benign cases or maybe an extremely early T1 cancer. Okay, but for the advanced cancers we see today, the standard is the technique from Holm and his colleagues, the extra levator APR or ELOP. ELOP is the standard. So what's the fundamental difference? How does ELOP -E get those better margins? It's all about the geometry of the specimen you remove. A conventional APR creates this kind of funnel shape as it goes down. Papering it at the bottom. Right, which can compromise the mesorectum right at the most critical point, whisking a positive circumferential margin. ELOP -E, on the other hand, creates a rigid cylinder. The dissection is taken way out to the lateral pelvic sidewall where the levator complex inserts. You take everything. So you're not just taking the anal canal, you're taking their whole muscular sling around it. The entire thing. And that approach removes 
roughly 69% more tissue around that intersphincteric plane than a conventional APR. 69%. That massive increase in tissue is what gives you that clean cylindrical margin and dramatically lowers the risk of wasting the specimen and causing a perforation. It's an oncological necessity, but it does have consequences. And that much larger defect from the cylindrical cut brings us right to the biggest post-operative headache, perineal wound complications. The overall rates are already high, 40 to 45%. But for patients who've had radiation, they skyrocket up to 60, even 70%. This is a huge source of morbidity. What's the mechanism there? Why do these wounds fail so often? It's a combination of things. You've got this massive empty space in the pelvis, the dead space, which is perfect for fluid to collect and get infected. And you combine that with the effects of radiation vasculitis, fibrosis, the blood supply is terrible, the tissue is stiff, it just doesn't know how to heal. So for these high-risk patients, the ones with radiation, diabetes, malnutrition, is just closing the skin of primary closure ever really enough? Based on the data we have now, the answer is almost always no. For a high-risk patient, you really have to be thinking proactively about tissue flap reconstruction. Meaning you bring in fresh, healthy tissue from somewhere else. Exactly. You use a well-vascularized flap, like a gracilis, a rectus abdominis, or a VRAM flap, or a gluteus maximus flap, to fill that dead space and bring in a pristine blood supply. And how strong is the evidence for doing that proactively? It's incredibly compelling. The meta-analyses show a massive reduction in major wound complications. In those high-risk groups, the rates can drop from that 40 to 70% range you see with primary closure all the way down to 0 to 30% if you use a flap. That difference is just too big to ignore. It is. It needs to be part of the initial surgical plan for any high-risk patient. Let's pull back now to the biggest picture of all, quality of life. For decades, the mantra has always been that saving the sphincter is always better, that an ultra-low anterior resection always gives a better QOL than an APR with a stoma. And that long-standing assumption is being seriously, seriously challenged by modern perspective data. I'm thinking specifically of the Aspire study. We have to stop looking just at anatomical preservation and start looking at the functional reality. Because saving the anatomy doesn't always save the function. Exactly. An APR is an anatomical loss, sure. But these sphincter sparing approaches can often result in a functionally compromised neosphincter. And that's the real aha uh -huh moment, isn't it? It reframes what success even means. What kind of dysfunction are we talking about in that group? We're talking about low anterior resection syndrome, or LARS, and the symptoms can be debilitating. Stool fragmentation, severe urgency, not being able to tell gas from stool, frequent incontinence. And it's unpredictable. Terribly unpredictable and so hard to manage. So, how does that functional chaos stack up against the stability of a well-made stoma? That's the key question. When they compared global quality of life scores at three years, the study found no significant overall difference between the APR group and the sphincter sparing group. No difference. None. Now, yes, the APR patients scored worse on things like body image and sexual function. That's predictable. But, and this is the critical contrast, the APR patients achieved a significantly better fecal continence status compared to those who were suffering from that devastating, unpredictable functional failure. So predictable, manageable continence through a stoma is often preferable to unpredictable, debilitating incontinence through an anatomically saved sphincter that doesn't work. Precisely. It shifts the entire focus. And we see this reinforced in other studies. Retrospective surveys of long-term APR patients find that even years later, about half of them say they'd choose the APR again. That suggests a real positive reappraisal of functional stability and control over time. It does. So, to summarize our deep dive in, APR is still an essential tool for a big subset of our patients. And success isn't an accident. It's driven by strict adherence to TME principles, that painstaking nerve preservation, and really careful patient selection with modern MRI. And critically, that proactive complication management. Using myocutaneous flaps for irradiated high-risk patients isn't an afterthought, it's part of the plan. Which brings us to a final provocative thought. Right. We tend to view APR as a last resort, you know, the procedure we fail to avoid. But given this quality of life data showing that it can provide superior stable continence compared to a failing biosphincter, mm. should our preoperative assessment focus more on the anticipated functional result? Should we be trying to predict the likelihood of severe LARS rather than focusing only on whether we can physically preserve the anatomy? It forces you to ask, what does success actually look like for this individual patient?
a really compelling thought to end on. Once again, this content is for reference only. Please always consult and adhere to your local guidelines and institutional protocols in clinical practice. If you found this deep dive useful, and if it helped sharpen your clinical thinking, please take just a moment to share it with at least one of your colleagues or friends. Help us spread the word. And also, be sure to check out our YouTube channel and our other social media pages for more in-depth content. Thank you for joining us for The Deep Dive. Thank you for listening to the Surgical Edge podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Help us grow and deliver even more relevant surgical content by pressing the support button. Your contribution truly makes a difference. And don't forget to share with us your advice, feedback and the topics you would like us to include.